Hey friends, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study on the Book of Revelation. This is now session 21. I'm going to begin jumping into chapter 7 in this session. Uh, chapter 7, essentially it's broken up into two primary parts, okay? The first part is where John has a vision of 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel who are sealed before these four angels who are at the four corners of the earth holding back uh, the, essentially the judgments of God before they harm the trees and the grass and all these different things. Before they execute these um, judgments on the earth, there's 144,000 who are sealed. Okay, so you, John has that vision. And then second, he has a vision of a great crowd in heaven. These are really two different visions, but they go together. Now in this session, I'm going to jump in and discuss the title of this session is The Mysterious Identity of the 144,000 revealed. Now as a little bit of a, uh, as sort of a kicker at the end, just in case you're wondering what is the mysterious identity, I'm just going to begin by saying I actually don't take a really hard, fast approach, a hard, fast dogmatic stance on their identity. We're actually getting into portions of the book of Revelation that are admittedly a bit difficult. Um, there are various positions, various interpretations, various ideas within the body of Christ in terms of who the 144,000 are. I will say regardless as to which position you take, there are difficulties and even, I'll go so far as to say, some problems. And so regardless as to which position I take, there will be people that will be very angry and in the comments uh, on YouTube and so forth, they'll just be like, you're an idiot and here's why. And then if I were to actually follow their approach, there would be other people who would say, you're an idiot and here's why. And so unfortunately, this is the nature of the book of Revelation. It often stirs up really strong opinions concerning issues that are admittedly, um, or at least I think we should admit, are fairly difficult. Okay, so I'm going to ask a few questions and try to answer some of these questions. So first of all, who are the 144,000? Again, 144,000, um, if you're fantastic at math like I am, which I'm not at all, um, that's 12,000 times 12. Okay, so you've got 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, which comes out to 144,000. The question is, is the number literal? So first of all, who are they? Who are these 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel that are described? Uh, is the number literal? What do they do? I mean, what's their purpose? Who are they, so to speak? Um, what is the seal? It says they're sealed. What, what exactly is this seal? And when will they be sealed? So let's go ahead and jump in. And I'll read the text, and then we'll begin talking about it. And what I'm actually going to do uh, in this session is do, I'll do essentially what I usually do, which is kind of address some peripheral but yet very important theological, larger theological issues that are very relevant, that are being discussed, they're controversial within the body of Christ, within the body of Messiah today. But these different theological controversies help us to understand really what we're looking at here in Revelation. Inevitably, when we read Revelation 7, we discuss the identity of the 144,000. These other issues that I'm going to talk about will come up in conversation and debate. And so I thought, let's just take them on, let's address them. Um, and then in the next session, Dalton will sort of jump in and continue to unpack this. There's a lot here. We could spend a lot of time on chapter 7. So Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. After this... John says, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. Now, let me just say this very briefly. Um, I probably shouldn't because, again, then I'll get a whole other class of people in the comment section that say, you're an idiot and here's why. Um, I made sort of the passing comment uh, joke in one of the previous sessions that the earth is not flat that um, when the scriptures say the stars of heaven will fall to the earth, that's not literal. The stars that we look up and see in the sky are actually the equivalent of our sun, uh, just different versions of it out there. And they're not little uh, LED lights, twinkle lights that are sort of planted in this uh, solid dome above a, a flat earth and this type of thing. So you, you got, and I understand if you're watching, you're going, why are you even addressing flat earth? It's actually it's very relevant, especially in light of what we're looking at here. Um, 
I get a lot of people that are like, of course, they really are lights that are planted in a solid dome and they will fall to the earth. That's literal. I take the Bible literally. Everything in the Bible is literal. You're not taking the Bible literally. Therefore, you're inconsistent in this type of thing. When you come to um, statements like this, four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, as if the earth, the earth literally is flat with four corners or however you envision it. Some people would just say, well, this is just a general statement, like the four corners of the compass, okay? But I think in fairness, we have to say the language is sort of um, portraying four corners of the earth. And you're going to get a whole host of people to say that is literal. Again, I take the Bible literally. The Bible is a literal flat earth scientific manual. Here's the thing with regard to hermeneutics, okay? And hermeneutics, the interpretation of Scripture. Scripture uses what we call... uh, it, it, it uses language in the same way that everyday language is spoken, okay? I call it rational literalism, which is to say most often when I'm speaking, if there's no reason to interpret what I'm saying as a joke or as sarcasm, if there's no reason to interpret it spiritually, you shouldn't. You should just take it literally. When I'm just speaking straightforward, it should be understood in a straightforward manner. That said, I do regularly make weird little jokes I use sarcasm, I use cynicism, sometimes I speak in riddles, you know, and this type of thing. And the more that you get to know me, my personality, my culture, you know the difference. Well, the Bible also uses idioms. It uses expressions, okay? The Bible is filled with these type of things, especially within apocalyptic literature, you get sort of figurative and symbolic language. Okay, you're going to get a whole host of people who, you know, again, they're going to say, this must be interpreted literally. And I always love to bring up the passage in Isaiah 66. Okay, okay, you take the Bible literally. Stars are literally going to fall from this sky and they're going to land on the earth, even though that's absolutely impossible, right? I read Isaiah 66 and it's speaking of the messianic age. And it says, during that time, it says, you will drink the milk of the nations and you will suck at the breasts of kings. And I go, okay, you take that literally, you know, and they're going to go, oh, I mean, you know, like suddenly it's very awkward, right? Like, do kings have breasts that give milk that you will suck on? Because that's exactly what it says. Or is this an idiom? Is this an expression talking about the blessings of the messianic age? Yes, it's an expression. It's an idiom. The Bible is filled with idioms particularly within apocalyptic literature. Statements such as the four corners of the earth, stars of the sky falling to the earth, this type of thing, they're not to be understood in a literal sense. And people will say, well, how do you know that? Well, again, because I know the earth is not flat. Um, You know, people, flat earthers say that the sun is actually far smaller than what we are told by these deceptive Illuminati scientists or whatever, even though many of them are Christians. And they'll say the sun is actually a small light that sort of just floats around over a very large flat earth. I go, well, if that's the case, then it would never set. It would just get smaller and further away. But at any point in the night, you could use a telescope. You could see it at any given time. It would never disappear. But it doesn't do that. It stays the exact same size. Now, granted, you can't look at the sun with your eyeballs. But if you put a filter on a camera, when it's directly overhead, and you measure it, it is precisely the same size as when it goes down over the horizon or rises up the other side of the horizon, okay? Simple things like this. You cannot produce a map of a flat Earth where the southern hemisphere is accurate. It's always going to be dramatically distorted. I've issued uh, challenges to any of the leading flat Earth proponents out there, any of the leading flat Earth teachers. Fly with me from Sydney, Australia to Santiago, Chile. And if it takes 30 30 hours or so, which is the case, that's how long it would be if the earth were flat, then I will pay for the ticket, I'll pay for all of the tickets, and I'll give uh, that individual $10,000. If, on the other hand, the flight from Sydney to Santiago takes around 14 hours, which is what it should take if the earth is a sphere, then that individual, the flat earther, will pay for all of the tickets and give me $10,000. I issued that challenge, I don't know, four years ago. No one has responded. And the reason is because the Earth is a sphere. Okay, so like there are things that we can just observe with our eyeballs to understand with our God-given brains. And yet what happens is people will say, well, but the Bible says, and therefore, it's essentially like folks who used to say, dinosaur bones are put there by Satan, they're fake, you know, because the Bible doesn't talk about dinosaurs, therefore this must be uh, a lie, this type of thing. Look, um, the Bible is not 
a scientific manual, and it, is, it does not teach a flat earth. Regardless as to what Michael Heiser says, the Bible uses what's called um, equivocal language, which is to say it can be understood by those who know for a fact that the earth is a sphere. They can read these passages and understand that the Bible's using figurative language, uh, symbolic language, and this type of thing. Or if you believe the earth was flat, you're not going to get hung up on these things. It's equivocal language that is true in any given period in human history. Okay, enough with the flat earth stuff. I'm going to move on. So you've got these four angels. They're holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind should blow on the earth or the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, ascending from the east. This is really cool because the sun rises in the east, right? So the angel is ascending from the rising of the sun and he has the seal of the living God. He has a special seal of the living God. This is interesting. You know, we find these various seals, the seal of Hezekiah or some particular king that they keep digging up and finding these, these um, clay seals that are used to, you know, create the wax seals from the ages of different kings there in the city of David in Jerusalem. This is, on the other hand, the seal of the living God, and it's not for wax seal. It's for the uh, servants of God. And so this angel cries out with a loud voice to the other four angels, whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bond servants of our God on their foreheads. So the seal of the living God is to go on the foreheads of the servants of God. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed, on and on and on. Now, there are tremendous issues and controversies that we can get into. Why do they include these particular 12 tribes here? Why do they have, um, they have Manasseh and I believe it has Ephraim, has Joseph. Um, why do they have, you know, and so there are, I don't know, I, I forget, there's several, maybe even like a dozen different references to the 12 tribes of Israel throughout scripture. And there's quite a few variations among them, you know, because there's some histories and different things. It doesn't mention, for instance, Dan here in Revelation, which some of the early church used to say, well, maybe, what's the reason for that? And they speculated and said, maybe the Antichrist is going to come from the tribe of Dan, you know, and this type of thing, which uh, was popular in um, Against Heresies by uh, Irenaeus in the early church. He speculated that, and that was actually a fairly widely held um, view. But again, it's just speculation. We're not going to get into all the controversies in terms of the tribes and so forth. Um, it's very rare for Judah to be mentioned first. I would speculate, and I think fairly confidently, that the reason Judah is listed first here is to give preeminence to the tribe from which the lion of the tribe of Judah is from. Okay, the Messiah comes from the tribe of Judah. Um, again, there's other issues there, but we're gonna just kind of leave that. It's just, um, there's, there's a lot of controversial side issues that we can get into, and we don't wanna spend too much time there. So who are the 144,000? Again, um, just appealing to our rule of hermeneutics, which I specified earlier. If there's no reason not to take something symbolically, um, then we just take it literally, okay? So when the scriptures say there are 144,000 sealed from the 12 tribes of Israel, I would say that probably what they refer to are 12,000, 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. Now again, some of the other positions are, well, they are not actually literal Israelites' bloodline. Israelites, rather, this represents the church at large. Um, usually those that embrace that are those who come from a place of replacement theology or supersessionism, same thing, which is the idea that the church is the new and the true Israel. The problem with that, of course, is that nowhere in the New Testament, nowhere, um, including the reference to the Israel of God in Galatians, nowhere is the church ever referred to as Israel. Uh, that type of terminology doesn't really begin to be used until much later in the writings of the early church fathers, um, in Justin Martyr, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the New Testament uses Israel to refer to Israel, okay? But again, replacement theology, supersessionism is pretty much dominant, or it has been dominant through much of the church, throughout much of history, and so you're going to see that position a lot. Now, others will see them as 
Jews, and then there's a few different categories. Well, these are, these are the remnant of Israelites that will get saved um, after Jesus returns. Some will say these are um, believing Messianic Jews, and that's actually the position that I'll take. That It seems to be most likely that it's referring to actual uh, living Messianic Jews who are the first fruits. Okay, they are the first down payment and deposit of the much larger number of Israel that will get saved when he returns. So just to sort of give away the answer at the beginning, I think that seems to be the most likely um, position. But now here's the question, and this is really the larger theological question that comes up. Because you go, well, wait a minute. You've got all 12 tribes here, and you're saying this is in our future or in our day, if we're living very close to the end times. In which case, you're saying that all 12 of the tribes of Israel are in the land of Israel today. And I, my answer is yes. And you'll say, but wait a minute, I thought the 10 tribes were lost. We're told all the time that the 10 tribes are lost. In fact, one of the, and this is the issue that I want to take some time to address, one of the um, ideas that's very popular in the body of Messiah today, particularly in the segment of the body of Messiah known as the Hebrew Roots Movement. Okay, now not everyone in the Hebrew Roots Movement believes this, and there are variations of this belief, but it's called the two-house doctrine, or the idea of the two houses of Israel. Essentially, what the two-house doctrine is, or teaches, and this really, it largely began with a few different people. So you had this couple, the Wootens, they, read, uh, they wrote a few different books, and you had another guy named uh, he goes by Moisha Kornikowski. His real name is Marvin Kornikowski. He had a sort of Hebrew roots messianic group down in Florida. And for what it's worth, he really went off the rails and um, got into all kinds of serious error. I mean, horrific, horrific bad doctrine. Um, we won't go down the list, but polygamy, slavery, like all kinds of concubines. Um, they'll call it Torah marriage and this type of thing. Um, and I'm not even sure if they're still, you know, functioning. But unfortunately, a lot of those ideas really spread in large segments and portions of the Hebrew, Hebrew Roots movement throughout the United States and perhaps throughout the world. Um, but these are the two folks that started articulating initially, again, the Wootens and Koinikowski, and I believe that what they believe is a little bit different. Again, there's some subtle differences. Uh, but essentially, they hold that after the Assyrians invaded the northern uh, kingdom of Israel, that those 10 tribes in the north were essentially lost. That they essentially became Gentiles, okay? They essentially became like pagan Gentiles. They lost their Jewish identity, okay? And so in the south, you have Judah and Benjamin. And then they would say, well, and there's some Levites that are sort of mixed in there. But other than Judah and Benjamin and some of the Levites, really most of the 10 northern tribes have been lost. They just became Gentiles. Okay, and so then what is taught from there is to say that, and again, here's where the variations are, is to say that the Lord is presently restoring and reuniting the whole house of Israel, both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, and he's doing that by calling born-again Christians back to Torah. They'll say, we are actually, as born-again Christians, we are actually the lost tribes of Israel. So as you can see, there's, there's a kind of a spin here, a twist on some of the stuff that was taught by Herbert Armstrong in the Worldwide Church of God, which is often referred to as Anglo or British Israelism, which is to say that the British, okay, the Brits, are actually the covenant people. They are where the ten lost tribes ended up. And so you end up with a lot of these Anglo-Saxons, Caucasians around the world, are claimed to be actually the lost tribes of Israel. Again, that's, that's Anglo-Israelism. The two-house doctrine is sort of a spin on that, or it's a modification of that. And so essentially what you have, again, so let's just say you have a born-again Christian in a Baptist church or a charismatic church, and they start getting interested in the Jewish roots of the scriptures. They get interested in the biblical feasts and this type of thing. They start studying parts of the Old Testament that they have never been familiar with. They talk about these things a lot. Their pastor gets very upset. This is usually the way it works. And the pastor says, you know, and they're stirring up controversy within the church. And then the pastor essentially forbids them from continuing with these things. They get sort of marginalized, eventually driven out of the church. Okay, so now they have sort of anger at the church. 
um, at traditional churches, and then they join, you know, these house groups and these different congregations that emphasize Torah and this type of thing. But usually within that, it's taught, well, you actually, you're drawn to these things, okay, because you are actually one of the lost children of Israel. So all of the promises to Israel now belong to you. Even though you were raised Gentile, even though you had a Gentile, non-Jewish identity, the fact that you're drawn to these things is proof that you're spiritually actually one of the lost tribes. This is usually kind of the way it plays out. Again, some people just say all born-again Christians are actually Israel, and thus we're obligated to keep the Mosaic Covenant to keep Torah. That's kind of the way it pans out. Others will say it's only those that are drawn toward, toward Torah uh, and this type of thing. Or some will just say, well, some... Some born-again Christians are among the lost ten tribes. Others aren't, okay? I think that's sort of the position that the Wootens take, is that, you know, you may be one of the lost tribes. Well, again, when you just look at that in sort of a pragmatic, realistic way, the idea is, I mean, you think about it. I personally, I'm Lithuanian, Latvian, German, Polish, Portuguese, English, Irish, and Italian. And I've, you know, when I do the Ancestry.com, like all of these things and more probably pop up. Um, and I had 1% European Jewish Jew, Jewry in me. Okay, so Ashkenazi, no Sephardic Middle Eastern Jew. I'm not sure that they can trace that with the Ancestry.com. That said, does that make me Jewish because I have 1%? You know, and this is the way the majority of people throughout the earth are today. There is a tremendous mixture. The idea, if you have some little slice or sliver, like probably... You know, you could go to China and people would have like a little sliver of, of Jew in them. Like if you could trace it down, like that would not surprise me. Places where you would not expect it, okay? There is, the, yes, the 10 tribes have been interspersed, but they just essentially were watered down. However, the idea that they were lost is completely unbiblical, okay? The idea that the 10 tribes of Israel are lost, that they disappeared, that they're not part of modern day Israel is completely unbiblical. And I want to look at some of the different passages, just survey a whole bunch of passages to establish this, because this is important. Because otherwise, we have a huge problem when we get to Revelation, and it says the Lord seals 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. Because if you start with the assumption that say, no, they're all lost, then something is wrong when you get to Revelation 7. Now, on the other hand, if you say, well, this is actually referring to Gentile Christians, then you, you have more goofiness. Um, but again, uh, as I said, it's just simply not biblical. So the passage, for what it's worth, that um, Koinikowski and the Wootens begin with, it's really one of the foundational texts to argue for this two-house theory. And by two-house, it would be the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And the idea is in the last days in Messiah, they're going to be restored, united together via Ezekiel 37, the prophecy of the two sticks. Um, that will be reunited into one kingdom, which is actually, they'll, they'll say it's Ephraim, which are actually Gentile Christians who thought they were Gentiles, but they're actually Israel, and Judah. And they would say Judah should never be referred to as Israel. Again, as we'll see, that's just fundamentally unbiblical. But the primary passage that they usually begin with is Genesis 48, verse 19. But I'm going to read 17 through 19. It says, when Joseph saw his father laid his right hand on Ephraim's head, so this is Joseph's two children, Ephraim and Manasseh. When he laid his hand on Ephraim's head, it displeased him, and he grasped his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Joseph said to his father, not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Manasseh is the firstborn. Again, his father is Jacob, is Israel. He says, place your hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He will be, become a people, and he will become great. So Manasseh will become a, an Am, A-M in the Hebrew, Am, and he will become great. However, his younger brother, Ephraim, he shall become greater than he, and his seed, his Zerah, his descendants, shall become a multitude of Goyim. Okay, so a multitude of nations. So what the proponents of the two house teaching will argue is to say that Ephraim, which sort of, it's a term used to represent all of the ten tribes of Israel. They became a multitude of Gentiles. So Israel becomes Gentiles. The problem is that argument is completely anachronistic. In other words, it doesn't work in terms of the time in which Genesis 48 took place. 
at this time, you didn't have the term goyim, which is to specify Israel or the Gentiles. Like today, you, you know, it's, you're either Israel or you're a goy, you're a goyim, you're a Gentile. Israel, Gentiles, okay? That categorization didn't exist back then. Back then, goyim just meant nations, just like a unified group of sort of ethnic uh, identity. And so really, you know, when he says they're going to become a multitude of nations, he just means they're going to become a vast throng of people. There's multiple places throughout the Old Testament where Israel is referred to as goy, a goy, a nation. But that doesn't mean they're Gentiles. Okay, so it's a misunderstanding of the very word itself. And so in the scriptures, words evolve and develop and they change down through time, just like words do today. So back in Genesis, the way that goyim was used is different than it's used much later. It's different, it's used in the New Testament, is the word is ethnos in the Greek. Okay, but let's just look at a couple examples. For example, again, if you want to try to say that goy always refers to Gentiles, non-Israelites, then you have huge problems when you get to passages like Jeremiah 31, verse 36. The Lord says, if this fixed order that's the rising of the sun, etc. If it departs from before me, declares the Lord, then this seed of Israel, the offspring of Israel, also shall cease from being a goy before me forever. Israel is a nation, a unified people. It's not a Gentile. That's not what's being said here. So here's an example where sometimes goy simply just means the way we use it in English, just a nation. It doesn't necessarily mean a non-Israelite. In which case here it would be saying, then the seed of Israel shall cease from being Israel. Like it just, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, likewise, all the way back in Exodus 19, verse 6, the Lord said, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. He's talking to Israel and a holy nation. The word there is goy kadosh, a holy nation. He says, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy goy. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. Now, the Lord was not saying you're going to be a bunch of Gentiles. He's saying you're going to be a holy nation. The English translation works much better here than if we were to read it in the Hebrew. And whenever you hear goy, you usually assume it means Gentiles. I'm going to throw up a bunch of other verses here if you really want to dig into this. For what it's worth, by the way, if this is something that you have believed but you're wrestling through it, there is an article that's been online for many, many years. Um, Dan Juster, I believe Russ Resnick, there's a handful that sort of got together and wrote this article. It's called The Ephraimite Error. It's a really long, pretty uh, thorough article, and it really works through all of the scriptural uh, reasons why the two house theory simply is unbiblical, and it's much more thorough. But I'm just touching on some of the primary texts. Now, look at this. To the exiles of Judah, Jeremiah the prophet declares this. Now again, Jeremiah was prophesying to the southern kingdom of Judah. Now again, the two house camp would say that Judah would never be referred to as Israel. Judah is always Judah. The northern ten tribes are Israel. The scriptures would never, the Lord would never refer to Judah as Israel. And I get people in the comment section, they go, you said the Jews came out of Egypt. That's wrong, ha, ha, ha. Again, in the most technical sense historically, that was the Israelites that came out. But by the New Testament times, they used the term Jew to refer to all of Israel, quite commonly. Paul the Apostle does. But again, look at Jeremiah, speaking to the specifically the exiles of Judah. He says, Fear not, O Jacob, that's Israel, my servant, declares the Lord. And do not be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from afar and your offspring from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and shall be quiet and at ease, and no one shall make him afraid. Jeremiah was prophesying to the southern kingdom of Judah, and he referred to them as Israel. So all the way back in Jeremiah's day, there was already this understanding that the people that lived in the southern kingdom of Judah were actually Israel. Why? Because, yes, the ten tribes were dispersed among the Assyrian territories, but many of them, not all of them, many of them did trickle back to the southern kingdom of Judah. You've got evidence of that throughout the scriptures. You've got clear references to the fact that there was a remnant that did return from the northern exile. They didn't disappear. They, didn't, they were not completely eliminated. They were not just assimilated into the Gentiles. That theory is, that idea is majorly, majorly overblown. In Ezra, 
2, 7. So now this is after the Babylonian exile. Ezra chapter 2, verse 7. After naming the genealogical list of the, all those that came back from the Babylonian captivity, we are told that all Israel lived in their cities. It doesn't say Judah. All of Judah lived in there. No, all Israel. These are the exiles that were from the kingdom of Judah that went to Babylon. After they come back, they're referred to in the scriptures as all Israel. In addressing the returned exiles, Nehemiah declared, this is Nehemiah 8.13, and compare it with verse 15. O house of Judah <clears throat> and house of Israel. House of Judah and house of Israel. That's the whole house of Israel. These are the exiles after the Babylonian captivity. They're not gone. They didn't disappear. Israel is still present in the land, according to the scriptures. In Luke 2, verse 36, in Jerusalem, in the, in, again, the first century, there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, and she lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And she had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. In any case, she's from the tribe of Asher. Okay, So again, you've got present, you've got some of, there might not have been the majority, but you had a residue, you had a remnant of those that were from the northern tribes living in Israel in the first century. They didn't disappear. They were not all assimilated. Yes, many did, but there is a remnant that returned. And so it was believed in Jesus' day that all 12 tribes were actually part of the current uh, nation of Israel. Look at this, Acts 4, verse 8 through 10. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, Rulers and elders of the people, he's speaking to his people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel. Let it be known to all the people of Israel. So here's Peter referring to Judah. Again, the two-house camp would say, no, that was Judah. That was not Israel. Peter referred to the first century Jews in Judah, in Jerusalem, as all of Israel. I, I, and I'm just hitting on a handful of verses. There's, there's literally dozens of others that all make this point. James, or Jacob, the brother of Jesus, he was the apostle, specifically according to Paul, sent to the circumcision, in other words, to the Jewish people, to the Pharisees and so forth. Paul refers to him as the apostle to the circumcision in Galatians 2, verse 9. He addresses his epistle. Who, would, who does he address it to? To the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. So not only were many back in the land, there were many that were dispersed abroad, and they had their identity. They still maintain their identity as these various tribes. And now, for what it's worth throughout history, just like, as I said, I'm Lithuanian, Latvian, German, Polish, you, have, you had a tremendous assimilation and mixture among the various tribes. That began way, way back. I mean, as early as the time of the judges, the tribes began to intermarry in this type of thing. But they still maintained an identity probably similar to we do today. If people ask me, what is your ethnicity? I'll say, well, I'm mostly Portuguese because that's primarily how I was raised. Most of my relatives were Portuguese. Turns out I did Ancestry.com and I'm actually Italian. We won't go down that road. But technically, I'm all of these things. Again, Lithuanian, Latvian, German, Polish, Portuguese, English, Irish, and Italian, and possibly even some Greek. Um, oh, and some Tunisian some from uh, North, North Africa. But the point is, you know, in the same way, in the first century, a Jew would say, yeah, I'm Naphtali. But he might have been a bit of, you know, Gad, Reuben, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? <clears throat> in Romans 11, 7 through 14, Paul states that the salvation, okay, in, in Paul's day, salvation had come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. Now think about this. If we are to understand that salvation that has come to the Gentiles, the two house would say, well, if salvation has come to Gentiles, that's proof that they're Israel. Salvation has come to the Gentiles in order to make Israel jealous. That wouldn't make any sense at all. Salvation has come to Israel in order to make Israel jealous. Or, you know, again, that would, no, salvation has come to the Gentiles, to the goyim, to non-Israel, in order to spur Israel on to jealousy, to provoke Israel. Throughout the New Testament, throughout really the Bible, Gentiles are never, ever referred to as Ephraim. 
There's not a single reference in the Bible where Gentiles are referred to as Ephraim. This is the language of the Two House Movement today. They'll say, oh, well, there's Ephraim and there's Judah. Not a single reference in the entire Bible. Gentile believers are never called to receive circumcision. Quite to the contrary. Paul says in Galatians, if you as a Gentile believer go on to be circumcised because you think it's your obligation according to Torah, you have fallen from grace. That's like a really serious, serious statement. Does that mean you can't repent and return to grace? I believe you can. But Paul basically lays it out. He goes, look, you as a Gentile, remain as you are as a Gentile. Don't try to become a Jew. Does that mean that you can't celebrate the festivals and keep kosher and all those things if you want to? No, absolutely. And I think it's wonderful that these things are being revived in the body of Messiah, but you're not as a Gentile obligated to those things. Not in no way, shape, or form. Otherwise, you would be obligated to be circumcised. And that's the whole point that Paul makes, which is the entrance into keeping Torah and living as a Jew, so to speak. So again, if they were Israelites, they would be expected to receive circumcision. It's just that simple. That is the sign of the covenant. Okay, so <clears throat> this is a big issue, again, within, you know, within the Messianic community, you have this sort of separate movement of the Hebrew Roots folks. And look, I, you know, I travel and I speak, and um, I'm friendly with some of the different Hebrew Roots groups and that type of thing. I don't want to make it sound like I'm attacking the whole movement. I'm just saying the two-house doctrine, which is very popular within a lot of these groups, is fundamentally unbiblical. And it, because of that, that actually is one of the roots of a lot of the problems um, in the movement. And I'll just, I'll be real frank, you know, I was with um, some friends I spoke, uh, wonderful believers, wonderful group, um, I won't even say where, uh, a couple of years ago. And a handful of these different congregations came together and I was just coming in to speak, uh, do a few sessions. And I asked the leader, I said, let me just ask you this question, because they would clearly identify as Hebrew roots, Torah observant, et cetera, et cetera. I said, how many families are there? How many you know, represent? He said, a little over 400 altogether between the four congregations. I said, just over the past few years, how many have left the faith? And he goes, oh man, he said, about 125 renounced Yeshua completely. And they actually, many of them, went into Hasidic Judaism. Um, there is, well, anyway, I won't go down that road, but look, there are things that the Lord is doing with regard to an interest in a return to the Jewish roots of our faith. I talk about these things all the time, but there are also tremendous dangers when we get off into some of these erroneous ideas and doctrines. They open the door to all sorts of errors. And the issue, really, that I referenced earlier, because it's a story that I've seen play out a thousand times. Again, you get this guy in the Baptist church or the traditional church, whatever, he gets interested in these things. He starts talking about it. He asks questions that the pastor is not really sure how to answer. Next thing you know, he's marginalized. He has a church wound. He's hurt by the church. One of the biggest problems that I personally see in the movement at large is this adversarial, hostile, even sort of condescending attitude toward traditional Christians, evangelicals, the churches. I left the churches this type of thing, once that seed of division enters, it opens the door for Satan. It's Satan's playground. And um, that's, again, sort of a side issue, but I thought it'd be worth touching on it. So I say all these things in love and hope that it's, uh, it's edifying and not seen as an attack. Okay. Not only is the, the Two House Doctrine widely believed in Sec segments of the body of Messiah today, the body of Christ. But another idea, which is really outside of the body of Christ, that's growing, is our ideas that are taught by the black Hebrew Israelites. Now, if you're not familiar with who they are, um, I won't get into all the details, but they're essentially a cult, okay, a cultic group. Um, they're sort of like a biblical version of the nation of Islam, Louis Farrakhan and this type of thing. It's sort of a black nationalist a uh, group that uses, instead of the Quran and all kinds of other weird stuff, like the Nation of Islam believes in UFOs and all these different things, the black Hebrew Israelites use the scriptures. And essentially what they teach is that if you're black or from, you know, they've got a real elaborate chart, you know, if you're from these islands or this or that, then you're one of the lost tribes of Israel. 
if you're white, then salvation is impossible for you. You're Edom and you're going to be judged my God and this type of thing. And they actually teach that the United States, for all intents and purposes, is Israel. And the Jews that live in the land, now listen, this is important. The Jews that live in the land of Israel today, they are fake Jews. They're, I don't know what they call them, they're Edom or the Khazarians or, you know, whatever. These sort of anti-Semitic ideas, this is just a really strange spin on replacement theology. It says if you're black, you're one of the, the lost tribes of Israel or you're one of the true tribes of Israel. If you're actually Israel, you're a fake Jew. I mean, it's like, it's such an incredibly, not only historically and biblically, untenable, undef indefensible position, but it's incredibly racist. So you've got a community that has dealt with tremendous historical injustice and pain and atrocities, right? That arguably today are continuing to wrestle with all sorts of different injustices and inequalities. But despite that, and this is why I say it hurts so much, the African-American church has been so strong historically in suffering, in perseverance. But today you've got, a tr like, it's amazing how many people are being swept um, up into this, being influenced by this. And it's such a convoluted, uh, like when you start trying to discuss these things with people, it's incredibly convoluted. But I want to just look at one passage in case you encounter this type of thing, because I'm actually starting to see these type of comments. Now, what happens for what it's worth, and you go, why are you addressing some fringe group? Because they're growing in influence in the African-American church. And if you go, but I'm not part of the African-American church, I go, but are you part of the American church? Are you part of the church? Are you part of the body of Christ? In which case, it should matter, because we're one body. Um, but when I came to faith in 1993, I was going to uh, Assembly of God, South Shore, Massachusetts, Brockton Assembly of God, great church there in Brockton, Massachusetts, inner city, real inner city church. And I remember being like out in the parking lot at night, or I used to walk around and do evangelism. And the black Hebrew Israelites were already spreading and growing back then in a lot of the urban core um, areas. And they would be in the field behind the church. There was sort of a sports field. And you would hear them back there doing push-ups and calisthenics, and you would hear them say, like, line up according to rank for prayer. You know, it was kind of like this real militant religious group, and they were recruiting people from uh, the local high school, Brockton High School, massive high school, and then recruiting people in uh, the prisons and so forth at, a, at an alarming rate. Now, today, they're everywhere. Like, you're seeing them in protests and so on and so forth, and it's really appealing um, even to those that, I'll say, you know, were raised in the church. And that's, that's devastating. That's devastating because here you have a community that has been unarguably victimized by Satan historically. But rather than persevering in the midst of that, uh, that pain and, and catastrophe, you've got many that are essentially being doubly victimized now with false teaching and actually forfeiting their salvation. Um, and they're taking the approach for what it's worth, you know, sort of like, well, we tried Martin Luther King Jr.'s approach, like we tried the way of Jesus. Now we're going to try the way of Malcolm X, you know, like kind of like forget this, turn the other cheek. We're going to, you know, it, it appeals to sort of the carnal um, side of things, which is we're going to take these things into our own hands. But uh, if you encounter these type of folks, I think one of the easiest passages to turn to, uh, again, they're, they're not logical. I... I actually, for what it's worth, funny story, I got into an argument with um, one of them years ago. Again, when I first got saved, I used to go into Boston and just share the gospel with anyone and, and you know, real bold, just street evangelism. And I remember I, I had a, started having a dialogue. There was a group out there um, preaching, and um, I started talking with one of them. Well, the problem is the main guy has a megaphone. And um, so I learned never get in an argument with someone who has a megaphone. And, um, and he was like, man, you don't know the scriptures. Scriptures are like a puzzle. You know, and he starts, and I realize like, this is a losing battle because I can't yell with the <laughs> level of a, of a, uh, a megaphone. Um, but in any, in any case, they say that those who are in Israel today are fake Jews, okay? There's so many passages we could look at to debunk that, but Joel 3 is a real easy one. Joel 3, verses 1 through 3. It's talking about the last days, and it's talking about the armies of the Antichrist. It says, For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. So what is the context? It's Jerusalem. It's not the United States. It's Judah and Jerusalem. 
I will gather all the Gentiles, all the nations, and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's Jerusalem. So he goes, I'm going to gather the surrounding Gentiles and bring them to Jerusalem. There I will enter into judgment with them on behalf of who? So again, there they are... The nations are invading and attacking the people who live in the land. So the people who live in the land today, according to the black Hebrew Israel, it's our fake Jews. Everyone else will say, no, they're Jews. Biblically speaking, that's all of Israel. The people that live in the land of Israel today represent all of the tribes of Israel. That's how Peter saw it. That's how the whole, that's how Jeremiah saw it. That's how Ezra saw it, how Nehemiah saw it. That's how all of the scriptural testimony will see the current people that live in the land of Israel as representing all of Israel. That type of terminology, we already saw it, is used throughout the scriptures. Okay, the black Hebrew, Hebrew Israelites would say they're fake Jews. What does Joel say? The Lord says, I will enter into judgment with the Gentiles there, where? In Jerusalem, at the Valley of Jehoshaphat. That's a very specific geographic uh, location. On behalf of who? My people. My inheritance, Israel. The Lord says the people who live in the land today are his people, his inheritance, and he calls them Israel. He doesn't say Judah. He doesn't say the Jews. He says Israel. And he says, whom they have scattered among the Gentiles, and they've divided up my land. The context is clearly the armies of the Antichrist attacking modern-day Israel, who the Lord refers to as my people, my inheritance, Israel. Now, there's a really important point here. And again, we're coming back to the issue of the 144,000. There's a mystery, okay? Now, today, uh, and again, I, I don't like to just sort of assume that based on the comments that I often see on YouTube, uh, that that necessarily determines where the majority of the body of Christ is. However, it is helpful in terms of seeing trends. And I will say that on social media, um, again, in comments on YouTube and this type of thing over the past several years, I have seen a tremendous rise and explosion of old recycled anti-Semitic ideas, doctrines, and concepts. And idea, you know, like you could say, well, over here you've got the black Hebrew Israelites that say the Jews that live in the land of Israel are fake Jews, but they're, they're just some weird cult, so why bother? Ideas today online, they become memes. You know, like, you know what a meme is, right? It's usually like a little picture. We send someone a meme, you know, you're excited, you send a picture of Will Ferrell going, yes, you know, like memes. These are things they, they're just repeated. Memes are also ideas, cliches that you see repeated over and over and over in comments on social media, ideas that go viral. They become like memes. So it could start with some cultic group, but next thing you know, regular Christians are parroting these memes, are recycling these memes. That's the way things work now with the internet and so forth. And one of the ideas that I'll see a lot, well, there's a whole host of different ideas, anti-Semitic ideas. You'll say, well, the Jews, they are antichrist. Look at 1 John 2, 22. It says, whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ, that's the spirit of antichrist. Who better embodies that than the Jews? I go, yeah, unbelieving Jews today, of which the majority in Israel are unbelieving, in that sense, they represent the spirit of antichrist, just like I did before I came to faith at age 19, just like the majority of the people throughout the earth today who are not Christians embody the spirit of antichrist, just like Muslims today deny the essence of the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. They call him the Messiah, but then they deny all of what that means. But whether you're a Buddhist, whether you're a Hindu, whether you're an atheist, they all people who are not believers carry the spirit of the Antichrist. Why single out the Jews? Why not just say all unbelievers are Antichrist? Therefore, how can you say that the unbelieving Jew, you know, like that would make better sense. That would make better sense. <clears throat> The way the Lord looks at Israel today, and this is so important, is because Paul said the day is coming when they will look upon the one they have pierced over them in the clouds when he comes back to save them, and all Israel will be saved, Romans 11, as Paul makes it so clear, as the totality of the, of the biblical testimony makes clear. Because of that, the Lord looks at them, even in their current state, and he calls them my people because he knows the remnant among them will be his people. And he calls us to relate to them that way as well. Yes, as Paul says, they, for the sake of the gospel, there are enemies. But for the sake of God's promises and his covenants, they're beloved. There is admittedly a bit of a paradox there. And we need to embrace it. 
And when you see people who only emphasize the negative, it's, I don't know how to, what an, it's, it's kind of like, like I'm allowed to discipline my own kids. I'm, al I'm allowed to spank my own kids. When someone else, a stranger, disciplines them or, God forbid, spanks them, that's not okay. And when you get these Gentiles, like, it's easy to open the scriptures and read these in-house rebukes where Moses is rebuking his people, where the Lord's rebuking his children. In-family correction. It's the easiest thing to open the scriptures and have someone who hates the Jews start quoting these in-family statements and go, but it's in the Bible. And I go, yes, but the spirit in which you are citing it is fundamentally satanic and not in accord with the Lord's heart, which is seen here in Joel 3, which is where he says, yes, they're unbelievers, but they're about to become my people. Okay, that's again, the majority of Israel in the land today are unbelievers. However, what about the 144,000? Well, <clears throat> I would suggest to you, again, I'm not overly dogmatic. I'm not dogmatic about this, but I would suggest that of the various options, who are the 144,000? The solution, the solution to the mystery of the identity of the 144,000 is simple. The best interpretation would seem to be that they are exactly what, who the text states they are. 144,000 from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Does that mean that they're clean cut and there's not some intermixture? No, we don't need to be overly rigid and technical with it. But the scriptures say they represent 144,000 from the tribes of Israel. Now beyond that, they seem to be a little more specifically, they seem to be the full number of faithful Jewish believers who are alive specifically when the sealing takes place, when they are sealed, which is God's protection. Now, does that mean that they're not going to be subject to being killed like any other martyrs, Gentile martyrs? No. They are sealed and protected from the wrath of God. They're sealed and protected from the judgments of God. But that doesn't mean that Satan's wrath and persecution, so to speak, is not going to fall on them but they are sealed, they are marked with the seal of God. Now the angels reference specifically to them as what? Bond servants of our God. Okay, so they're not just um, the total number of Jews who will get saved when Jesus returns. They are the first fruits. And that's exactly what it says later in Revelation 14, where it references the 144,000 again, and we're skipping ahead, but we're gonna come back to this later. So Revelation 14, one through five. John says, Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. So the seal is his name and the name of his Father. And they sang a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And then he goes on, he says, These are the ones who have not been defiled with women. Now I take that as an idiom. I don't think it means they're all virgins. I think it's just an expression saying they've kept themselves pure. I don't think it means they're all men. I don't take that in that really rigid, uh, overly rigid, I would argue, literal sense. I think it's just an expression. They have kept themselves chaste. These are not those that kept their Mormon underwear on the whole time. Let's just put it that way. The, the, you know, there's nothing wrong within marriage, right? I don't think these are just purely men. I think these are men and women. These are the first fruits among the Jewish messianic community. 144,000, by the way, that's wonderful news. Why? Because there's only roughly 20,000 or so Messianic believers in the land today. That means there's a great number that's about to come in before the return of Jesus. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. So when you ask who are the 144,000, I would say they probably are who the scriptures say they are. First fruits from among the tribes of Israel in the land of Israel, representing all 12 of the tribes of Israel. So I'm going to end it right there. Um, we could talk more about the seal of God um, and the mark of the beast, but I think we've got plenty of time to talk about that in the future. So I'm going to leave it right there. Next week, Dalton's going to jump in and sort of unpack this a bit more and as well as address the issue of the great crowd, um, because I think it does speak, it's, it, it's very important in terms of speaking in terms of the larger plan that God is doing with Jews and Gentiles, his larger story of redemption, the one new man, and so forth. So amen. That's it. I hope this was um, edifying. Uh, I, hope it was, uh, I hope it was relevant. So I look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, God bless, guys, and Maranatha.